Right off the bat, we run into a common pattern in Haskell, creating embedded domain-specific languages, or EDSLs for short. Domain-specific languages are specialized programming languages that are tailored to specific domains, in contrast to general-purpose languages, which try to work well in many domains. Here's a few examples of DSLs. Make for defining build systems, dot for defining graphs, set for defining text transformations, CSS for defining styling, and HTML for defining web pages. And embedded domain-specific language is a little language which is embedded inside another programming language, making a program written in this EDSL a valid program in the language it was written in. The little HTML library we've been writing can be considered an EDSL. It's used specifically for building web pages by returning HTML strings and is a valid Haskell code. In Haskell, we frequently create and use EDSLs to express domain-specific logic. We have EDSLs for concurrency, command line option parsing, JSON, HTML, creating build systems, writing tests, and many more. Specialized languages are useful because they can solve specific problems in a concise and often safe way. And by embedding, we get to use the full power of the host language for our domain logic, including syntax highlighting and various tools available for the language. The drawback of embedding domain-specific languages is that we have to adhere to the rules of the programming language we embed in, such as syntactic and semantic rules. Some languages elevate this drawback by providing metaprogramming capabilities in the form of macros or other features to extend the language. And while Haskell does provide such capabilities as well, it's also expressive and concise enough that many EDSLs don't need to have them. Instead, many Haskell EDSLs use a pattern called the combinator pattern. They define primitives and combinators, where primitives are basic building blocks of the language, and combinators are functions that combine these primitives to more complex structures. In our HTML EDSL, our primitives are functions such as HTML, HTML and title that can be used to create a single HTML node. And we pass other constructed nodes as input to these functions and combine them to a more complex structures with the append function. There are still a few tricks we can use to make our HTML EDSL even better. We can use Haskell type system to make sure that we only construct valid HTML. So for example, we don't create title node without a head or have user content that can include unescaped special characters and throw a type error when the user tries to do something invalid. And second, an hour HTML DSL can move to its own module so it can be reused in multiple modules. In this section, we'll learn how to create our own distinguished types for HTML and how they can help us avoid invalid constructions of HTML strings. There are a few ways of defining new types in Haskell. In this section, we are going to meet two ways, new type and type. A new type declaration is a way to define a new distinct type for an existing set of values. This is useful when we want to reuse existing values, but gives them different meaning and make sure we don't mix the two. For example, we can represent seconds, minutes, grams, and yens using integer values. But we don't want to accidentally mix grams and seconds. In our case, we want to represent structure HTML using text values, but distinguish them from everyday strings that are not valid HTML. A new type declaration looks like this. You have a new type followed by the type name, equals constructor name and existing type. The first HTML here to the left of the equal sign lives in the types namespace, meaning that you will only see that name to the right of a double column sign. The second HTML lives in the expression or terms and values namespace, meaning that you will see it where you expect expressions. The two names for the type name and the constructor don't have to be the same like in this example, but they often are. And note that both have to start with a capital letter. This right hand side of the new type declaration describes the shape of a value of the type. In our case, we expect a value of type HTML to have the constructor HTML and then an expression of type string, for example, HTML hello or HTML of hello plus world. You can think of the constructor as a function that takes the argument and returns something of our new type. So for example, our HTML constructor takes the strings and returns an HTML. And note that we cannot use an expression of type HTML the same way we'd use a string. So adding hello plus HTML of the world would fail at a type checking. And this is useful when we want encapsulation. We can define and use existing representations and functions for our underlying types, but not mix them with other unrelated to our domain types, similar as meters and feet can be both numbers, but we don't want to accidentally add feet to meters without any conversion. So for now, let's create a couple of types for our use case. We want two separate types to represent a complete HTML document and a type for HTML structures such as heading and paragraphs that can go inside the tag. We want them to be distinct because we don't want to mix them together. The first one we already saw, we create a new type for HTML, which is wrapper over a string. And quite similar for the new type of the structure. A structure is a wrapper for a string. 
In order to use the underlining type that the new type wraps, we first need to extract it out of the type. We do this by using pattern matching. Case expressions are kind of beefed up switch expressions. The expression is a thing that we want to unpack and the patterns is concrete shapes. For example, this way we can extract the string out of the structure and return it. Case struct is the expression, structure of a string is the first pattern, and then we extract the expression out of it. In later chapters, we'll introduce data declaration, which is kind of struct plus enum, where we can define multiple constructors to a type. Then these multiple patterns of a case expression will make more sense. For now, we can use an alternative which is useful when declaring a function, we can use pattern match on the argument. So for example, instead of writing it the full way, we can simplify it and pattern match right away. Using the types we created, we can change the HTML functions we've defined it before, namely HTML, body and paragraph to operate on these types instead of strings. One very cool thing about new type is that wrapping and extracting expressions does not actually have a performance cost. The compiler knows how to remove any wrapping and extraction of the new type constructor and use the underlying type. The new type and the constructor we defined are only there to help us humans distinguish between the type we created and the underlying type when we write our code. They are not needed when the code is running. New type provides us with type safety with no performance penalty. Let's check out another operator that will make our our code even more concise. It's another interesting and extremely common operator, which is a regular library function Haskell. It's a dot, which is pronounced compose. This operator was made to look like the composition operator you may know from mathematics. Let's look at its type and implementation. The compose takes three arguments, two functions named f and g here, and a third argument named x. It then passes the argument x to the second function g and calls the first function f with the result of g of x. Note that g takes as input something of the type a and returns something of type B and F takes something of this type B and returns something of the type C. It's important thing to know that types which start with lowercase letter are type variables. Think of them as similar to Legro variable. Just like a content variable can be any string like hello or world, a type variable can be any type, boolean, string, even string to string or int to int. This ability is called parametric polymorphism. Other languages often call this generics. The catch is that the type variable must match in signature. So if for example we write a function with the type signature a to a, the input type and the return type must match, but it could be any type. We cannot know what it is. So the only way to implement a function with a signature as the ID, short for the identity function, which returns the exact value as received. If we try any other way, for example, returning something made up like a string hello, or try to use x like a value of a type we know, like writing x plus x, the type checker will complain. It's not allowed in Haskell. Also remember that the arrow is right associative. This is what a signature is equivalent to. So doesn't it look like a function that takes two functions and returns a third function that is actually the composition of the two? We can now use this operator to change our HTML function. Let's start with one example with a paragraph. Before we had element of p, now we can change the type to the structure and wrap it in the structure. The function p will take any arbitrary string which is the content of the paragraph we wish to create, wrap it in a p text and then wrap it in the structure constructor to produce the output type structure. Let's pretend like we are a compiler and take a deeper look at these types. Let's see why the expression structure composed with element p type checks and why its type is string to the structure. First, we write down the type of the outermost function, which is the dot operator in this case. After that, we can try to match the type of the arguments we apply to the function with the type of the arguments from the type signature. In this case, we try to apply two arguments to a composition, a structure, which goes from string to a structure, and element p, which goes from string to string. And luckily, the composition expects two arguments, which has types b to c and a to b. And note, if we apply a function with more arguments than it expects, is a type error. Since the dot operator takes at least the number of arguments we apply, we continue to the next phase of type checking, matching the types of the inputs with the types of the expected inputs. When we match two types, we are checking for equivalence between them. There are a few possible scenarios. When the two types are concrete, as opposed to the type variables and simple like int and boolean, we check if they are the same. If they are, the type check and we continue. If they are not, they don't type check and we throw an error. When the two types we match are complex, for example both are functions, we try to match their inputs and outputs in case of functions and if the input and outputs match, the two types match. And 
a special case when one of the type is a type variable. In this case, we treat the matching process more like an equation and we write it down somewhere. The next time we see the type of variable, we replace it with its match in the equation. Think about assigning a type variable with a value. So in our case, this is what we want to match. So let's do this one by one starting with first one, where we match a function from string to a structure and b to the c. Because the two types are complex, they're both functions and match their inputs and outputs. So string goes with a b and structure goes with a c. And because b is a type variable, we mark down somewhere that b should be equivalent to string. We can write it like this notation where we note the equivalence of b and string and we match structure and the c. Same as before, c should be equivalent to a structure. Uh, seems good so far. Let's try matching string with a string and a and b. It should be the same. Two types are complex, then string should be matching with an a and string should be matching with a b. But in this case, we remember that we have already written about b. Looking back, we see that we already noticed that b is equivalent to string. So we need to replace b with a type that we wrote down before and check it against this type. So we match string with a string. Fortunately, type check because they are the same. So far, so good. We've type checked the expression and discovered the following equivalence about the type variables in it. So a should be equivalent to string, b to string, c to structure. So now we go back one level and we ask what is the type of the expression. We say that it's the type of dot after replacing the type variables using the equation we found and removing the inputs we apply to it. So we started with the function, which is b to c, a to b and a to c and replace it with string to structure, string to string and string to structure. And now we remove the two arguments when we apply the function. So now we applied the first argument, we applied second one and we get the rest string to structure, which is the type of the expression. And which was quite a journey and fortunately Haskell is able to do this process for us. But when Haskell complains that our types fail to type check and we don't understand exactly why, going through this process can help us understand where the types do not match and then we can figure out how to solve it. Another quick note, if we use parametrically polymorphic functions more than once or use different functions that have similar type variable names, the type variables don't have to match in all instances simply because they share a name. Each instance has its own unique set of type variables. For example, if we use id function, which goes from a to a, we use this id twice for no good reason, that's just because for demonstration purposes. The first id here takes a character as an argument, see, character right here, and it's a is equivalent to, to character. So this is gonna be character for this case. But the second id takes an integer which is one as an argument and it distincts a as equivalent to int but this only applies to functions at top level if we define a local function to be passed as an argument for example in this case to increment character this might look as a similar type signature as an id which goes from a to a but actually we cannot use it this is not going to type check you can try it out you'll see the error it's pretty nice before, when we wanted to create richer HTML content and appended nodes to one another, we use the append operator. Since we are now not using strings anymore, we need another way to do it. While it's possible to overload append operator using a feature in Haskell called type classes, we will instead create a new function and call it simply append and cover type classes later. This append function should take two structures and return a third structure, appending the inner string in the first structure to the second and wrapping the result back in the structure. So we want a function that takes two structures and returns another structure. As we recently learned, we can do some pattern matching on it to extract the actual string from a structure. Because we have the underlying strings, we can use the, the original append operator to combine the strings together. But then we have to wrap it up back in the structure. After constructing a valid HTML value, we want to be able to print it to the output so we can display it in our browser. For that, we need a function that takes an HTML and converts it to a string, which we can then pass to put string line. So we need to implement the render function for this. Render is a function from HTML to a string. And notice the name convention, we don't have to use underscore anymore because it's not part of the DSL, it's a way to go from DSL to Haskell. We pattern match on HTML, get the underlying string and return it back. Let's look at one more way to give new names to types. A type definition looks really similar to a new type definition. The only difference is that we reference the type name directly without a constructor. For example, in our case, we can write type title equals string. What's the difference? So type in contrast with new type is just a type name alias. When we declare a title as a type alias of a string, we mean the title and string are interchangeable. And we can use one or the other whenever we want. So hello string is a title and hello string is also a string. Both are valid in this case. We can sometimes use types to give a bit more clarity to our code, but they are much less useful than new types, which allow us to distinguish two types with the same type presentation. And now we have to draw the rest of the owl. We have to change the code we wrote in previous chapters to use the new types we created. 
First, we need to catch up with the book. We forgot to add the type title, which is just a string. And then we have to update the h1 that also returns the structure similar to the p1. Then the book suggests that we can combine make HTML and HTML and remove body, head, title by calling element directly in HTML. So let's drop three of these and merge the two HTML functions into one. This makes our HTML EDSL less flexible, but actually more secure and compact. The next step is to use the element function directly. This does not compile. The first problem is the content right here is not a string, but actually a structure. The first thing we need to do is to unwrap the structure to get the underlying string. The compiler is still not happy. The problem this time is that we need to return HTML and we return a string. So we need to wrap it in the constructor. Now we can use it. Use the new function and the new type. Now the main is not happy because we're not rendering it, but we need to do it. Now the error is back at my HTML. We try to use the old map end operator, but we actually not working on strings, but we are working on the structures. If you remember, we have a new function that we can use instead. And now the code compiles and everything works. So are we safe yet? We made some progress. Now we cannot write hello where we'd expect either paragraph or heading. For example, here, we cannot forget about the structure. It's not gonna work, but we can still write invalid structures. For example, while we create one here, we're gonna get something that is not a paragraph, now a heading. So while we made it harder for the user to make mistakes by accident, we have not really been able to enforce the invariants we want to in our library. In the next part, we'll see how to make invalid expression, such as invalid HTML structures, illegal. We'll learn to use modules and smart constructors.